Carbon Stars with Luca Vanzella on episode 333 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. I'm Chris and joining me is Shane. We are amateur astronomers who love looking up at the night sky and this podcast is for everybody who likes going out under the stars. Luca Vanzella has been an active amateur astronomer since 1975 when he purchased his first telescope, which was a orange tube Celestron C8 or an 8-inch schmidt cassegrain since then, he has been mainly an observer and avid skyscape shooter, and sometimes eclipse and transit chaser. As an observer, Luca worked his way through the Messier and finest NGC lists with special attention to globular clusters. In March 2016, Luca completed his first Messier marathon. Luca has since completed the Astronomical League's double star list, multiple star list, and the Herschel 400 list he is currently slogging through, as well as the Herschel 2 In 2016, Luca published the Carbon Star Hunter list. Luca joined the Edmonton RASC, or the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, which is like our local centers and astronomy clubs here in Canada. Anyway, he joined the Edmonton Center of that in the mid-1970s and was a member for a few years. University and work life took over, causing him to take a hiatus in the hobby. And around the year 2000, he rejoined the society. Since then, Luca has served the Edmonton Center in various capacities, including Schlepper, volunteer, General Assembly organizer, outreach event coordinator, secretary, national council rep, webmaster, vice president, and president. Luca is currently on the team building the Black Nugget Lake Observatory, and he also has interest in carbon stars, of course. The Black Nugget Lake Observatory is where they're going to house their 32-inch telescope, so kind of hope we can talk about that maybe as well. Welcome to the show, Luca. Hey, thanks very much for having me. Yeah, I hope your smoke isn't uh, too bad up there. It actually hasn't been too bad, given the number of fires in, that have uh, occurred uh, in Alberta. We've been very lucky with the num- number of times the smoke's been really bad. So it's been pretty good, very hazy. And uh, just today, though, the smoke started rolling back into town. But it hasn't been too, too bad, uh, considering this year's record wildfire season. And you do some skyscape shooting as, as well. Can you just tell us uh, a little bit about that? Not long ago, I did uh, some film-based astrophotography, and then I just, it ended up taking away too much eyepiece time, and so I found I was more attracted to visual observing, and so I just didn't really get into too much astrophotography, especially because it takes too, especially in the transformation to digital with all the computer processing you have to do. So I, I stayed away mainly from that, but a long time ago, back about 15 years ago, I Notice some of the skyscape photography that uh, fellow center member Alistair Lane was doing, uh, and he would post to our to our list a few skyscapes, especially moonrises. And I was in- interested. Uh, that got me interested in getting back into some photography. And I realized that I didn't have it wouldn't wouldn't take away from dark sky time or nighttime observing if I just limited myself to skyscapes because it would be either twilight or daylight. So I joined him on some uh, on some photography shoots and just got into it over the years. And so it became more and more avid. So I concentrate mainly on moonrises and sets and sunrises and sets. And I've done a fair bit of work on that over the last uh, 15 years. Some, uh, one of them appeared in the Calen- RASC calendar f- a number of years ago, and, and some have been featured on APOD. I'm, I'm curious, uh, have you had much luck taking photos of noctilucent clouds? Uh, I've done, yeah, I've done a fair bit of that. Uh, I don't usually like to stay up that late to photograph clouds, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I've done it. So when I've been off for late night uh, moonrises um, and thing, uh, or moonsets, getting up late to get a to get a moonset or something like that. So it's I've done a little bit of that, but it's not really a focus of mine. Chris, I was just going to say, you know, just on the topic of noctilucent clouds, I haven't seen any this year. I'm not sure if either of you have had. Uh, any observations of them and you know they seem to kind of some years are good years some years are not good years maybe this just isn't a good year yeah uh, i don't know our one of our avid uh, nlc observers that kept us all informed about them which with his nightly patrols uh, he sadly passed away last year so he's no longer doing it not doing it anymore and of course and so so there's been another member that's been taken up taking taking it up and he hasn't reported too many observations so it could be that it's a down year but i haven't really followed it up i'd have to ask mark zalchik of the center who's our coordinator of nlc uh, data gathering and to see what he has to say but yeah i haven't really noticed it much myself and there hasn't been very 
very many reports, even on the local observing list, saying, hey, get out and go see the NLCs tonight or something like right. that. It's yeah. been less than usual. One of the uh, photos that you had taken was a beautiful solar analemma. Right. That was a lo- that was a slog of a project. <laughs> <laughs> which I decided to do foolishly on film. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, one mistake and uh, you got to start over again. It was a comment that somebody had made about an analemma that had got published uh, and they had said something about, you know, would this be the last time somebody would ever do it on film? And I had this old Canon camera laying around that I hadn't used in a long, long time. So I just said, hey, I think I can do, I'll, I'm going to do one of those. So I started on a, I thought, oh, it might take me, you know, might take, it, well, you need a year to do it. I said, well, you know, maybe I can do it in a year. You get pretty nice sunny skies here in Alberta. And uh, I thought maybe two, two at the most. Well, it took four years to get it done because of various, <laughs> various tribulations. Uh, I, I started it and I, and I had to start it, you know, uh, four, yeah, four times. Once because of uh, shifts in the camera mount that I hadn't noticed, and you can't change the framing. My uh, then there was a problem with uh, the bench, the park bench I was using as my mount, this fixed mount at an over overlook of the river valley. The city changed the bench one summer, and it's like, oh, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> oh, gee. And there was that, and and there was uh, there were a number there were a number of things that uh, you know. So by the time I started it for the it was about to start it for the fourth time, I said, you know what, I'm going to run a parallel since I'm spending all this time doing it anyway. I'm going to run a parallel digital one because at least with those, as you get the frames, you can just save them, right? And mm, yeah. one mistake, you just toss it out and continue, right? So I ran a, a parallel one at the end. And they both concluded. Finally, they, you know, once I brought the digital camera into the into play, they both concluded successfully. So, yeah, I did get a film based and a digital one together. Wow, that's cool. So the solar analemma, that's essentially it maps out this sort of strange looking figure eight pattern that the sun travels through the sky during the course of the year. Right. That's that's sort of what I'm thinking. Right. About. Well, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's really a, a, a graphical or visual depiction of the equation of time, which is really the diff, which sounds fancy, right? And it, you know, <laughs> and there is an equation, but uh, what it really is is the difference between clock time, what our clocks say, which run on a twenty-four hour cycle, and Earth's rotation, which isn't exactly twenty-four hours, twenty-three hours fifty-six minutes. So there's a drift there. And it also has to do with the angle of, angle of the Earth's orbit or the or angle of the Earth's the Earth's rotational angle with respect to its orbital plane and the fact that the plane's an ellipse. So there's all these factors. But the big thing is the difference between clock time and solar time. And so if you stand and photograph, look at the sun at the same clock time every day, the sun doesn't reach that exact same position every day. And it turns out it looks like a figure eight. I made a video because I had a digital one. I made a video of that so you could watch the figure eight. Wow. Uh, there's a video associated with that thing. You can watch the figure eight being formed with oh, different daytime uh, foreground shots through the seasons of Edmonton, right? The, oh, neat. All four seasons. One of the, one of the fairly common comments on, in, in the comment section on the YouTube video for that is these one sentence one sentence proclamations from various people that say that my video proves a flat earth. <laughs> Excellent. That was your goal, wasn't it? <laughs> That's right. I don't actually, I don't actually comment. I don't actually respond to those comments. I just let them, I just let them sit there. But in fact, it proves, it, it proves the op. If it proves anything, it proves the opposite of that. But anyway, that is a fair, you know, every few months a comment crops up as somebody discovers a video and says, Hey, Bruce Fowler. I was thinking though, as you were describing it, you were you were saying it's a, an explanation of the equation of time, and I was thinking that it it's not a vertical aid. It's it's sort of a little bit canted depending on your your latitude, right? If, I guess if you're the angle, sorry, the angle depends on the time of day you shoot. Oh, okay, right. So if you were shooting at local noon, right, it would be vertical. Oh, okay. so it's kind of like it's kind of like a an analog clock face, right? So I shot in the morning at about at nine fifty a.m. local time. Oh, okay, and I, I had to shoot that late in the morning because in winter sun doesn't come up. I had to make sure I could get the winter sun, 
So if I'm shooting at 6.30 in the morning in the summer, in the winter, I'd get nothing, right? They'd only right. Get the bottom yeah. half of the analemma would just be below my horizon. So I chose 9.50 to ensure that the December solstice sun would be at least maybe five degrees, you know, three to five degrees off the horizon, just yeah. to avoid local low horizon clouds obscuring it, right? So it's a, it's sort of a 9.50 a.m. And then if you shoot around noon, it'd be vertical. And if you shoot in the afternoon, it would be tilted to the right. Oh, so okay. its angle is a function of time of day of shooting. All right. Well, that's that's a great explanation of it because I, I've often looked at that and not quite understood. But I, I was thinking, though, the eight sort of on its side is is the symbol for infinity and, right. and sort of the equation of time playing into that. It, there's sort of a beautiful uh, tie-in. And the height of it is always 47 uh, degrees. It's because it's twice the Earth's axial tilt of 23 and a half. Oh, yeah, That's there's a lot. There's there's lots going on. There's lots going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> which we I, could devote another podcast to. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no kidding. I, I never knew there was so much with this. Yeah. So the analemma <laughs> could. You know, we could talk all. We we could forget about carbon stars and switch to analemma if you want. <laughs> but of course, I'd have to dig up my my uh, notes. In fact, if if you are interested, you can look up my article in the RESC journal uh, mm. that talks about the project. Yeah, and gives you the background on the on the analemma itself. Yeah, when was that? Because the journal is free now at uh, resc.ca yeah. under publications. Do you remember what? Uh, anyway, they, people can probably surf through. Or, but you know what? If people Google it, it will come up in Harvard Abstracts. Right, that's yeah. right. So you and I had actually met. Uh, you know, you were talking about your various roles and responsibilities, and one of them was running the GA at uh, the Edmonton Center in was it twenty twenty twelve. 2012 was it that? That's, yeah, 2012 because our promo video uh, involved um, the uh, the Trans- doomsday predictions yeah. of uh, that the Mayans had figured oh, out yeah. that would happen, and right, and we wondered would there actually be a GA or not, right? <laughs> well, and then that happened where we almost didn't have GAs for a while. That's now- true. And now they're online. You, by the way, fantastic job at that. I remember I, I had heard your name before just, and and I think mostly because I, I read the journal and and uh, sort of know who's doing interesting observing projects nearby. And uh, and then when I got to the GA, I was like, oh, Luke is kind of just about running the show here, which which was interesting. And I really enjoyed that GA and got to, I got to meet a lot of Edmonton centers that I had, uh, members that I had only just uh, you know, met uh, through email or or uh, other online discussions, and I, I found out that the Edmonton Center. You know, it's very cold in Edmonton in in the winter. I hear even even more so than Regina, perhaps. I think usually we're competing for the the coldest city. But mm-hmm. uh, I remember uh, talking to Bruce McCurdy, and he was he was saying, "Well, it, when it gets really cold, they turn the astronomy club into a beer club." So <laughs> I always like that. <laughs> That's right. We're, that's right. We're always uh, we're always pursuing some uh, some uh, hobby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I find that you can't really mix them too too much because no. if I'm if I'm drinking beer, yeah, uh, it's tough. To, it's tough to go observing, and then even if I am observing, and my eyes just aren't working properly. So it's uh, it's yeah. You really have to kind of separate them a little bit. I had to had to make that choice uh, last night, but I was curious as as somebody who helped run a GAC. I'm gonna I'm really gonna be a bit of a muckraker here. Somebody who had run the the in person. I really like the in person events because you can go, you know, and talks talks are always great. They're great, but but for me, really the best part is just just hanging out with uh, observers. Like I said, that maybe I just chatted with online or or whatever, and really meeting up with them in, in person. And, uh, and certainly at Edmonton Center, we, we did have a, have a couple beverages. What, what are your thoughts sort of on the virtual GA versus the in-person GA? I'm just curious, as, uh, from the standpoint of somebody who helped organize one. Well, they're, I mean, they're, they're not the same. I mean, it's, you can't, <clears throat> a, li- a live event like a GA, like any conference really is, you just can't duplicate that online. It's just the, the, the experience is just, is just different. I mean, it's easy, possibly easier to organize an online event because there's a lot less physical logistics you have to worry about, but. But the, the camaraderie and the, and the, and the, the side discussions and the, the chance encounters and, 
um, the coincidences, all those aspects just don't, just can't occur online. So there, you re- really lost a lot uh, mm-hmm. by switching to online. Things like things like podcasts, right, which is an audio experience like we're yep. doing here. I mean, those are those are different, uh, and those can be. You don't have to. You don't. You don't. It didn't have to be there live. You can get pretty well the entire experience listening to it after the fact. But a GA. Yeah, the formal presentations and all of those things, you could record them and watch yep. them later and it, even watch them online. But you're only going to get a fraction uh, of the total experience. I, um, I for one, so I, like, they're not the same to me. Yeah, I, I for one like to see them return to in-person in, in some way. S- somehow, I know things are getting more and more expensive, having recently traveled out to uh, to Ontario. But when I when I was in Ontario, I went and... And went uh, and had dinner with some of my observing friends that uh, that I had, you know, from from back when I lived in Ontario, and then some some observing friends that live in Ontario that I'd never met before that we had just been chatting with, uh, or that I'd been chatting with online. I guess well, we because because she and I were chatting with them, um, and it's just such a rich experience, like hanging out with people in real life. And I think that's the one thing the pandemic taught me is is just how much I I enjoy and and appreciate just sitting down and hanging out with people and having dinner, which seems like a very simple thing. <laughs> yes. We used to have uh, pre-meeting dinners with our invited speakers at the regular meetings, which was a great way to get to know the speaker beforehand and get everybody relaxed on uh, that uh, before we actually did the thing. And so we've, you know, those went away during the online meeting era, but we're bringing all that back now. And it's Good. it's a lot more fun that way. We kind of covered off a little bit of your early starts in astronomy, Luca, but uh, how did you first get interested in the hobby? Well, I'm a child of the space race to the moon. So that's really how it got started, which is a pretty fairly common story of yeah. uh, people my age. Uh, just the the, the space race uh, to get to the moon in the 60s captivated me and and that got me that got me thinking about looking up into the sky and looking at the moon. And that really is what uh, was the catalyst for my uh, getting interested in astronomy was, was this U S space program. For sure. Yes. Yes. They did go to the moon. (laughs) Despite having less computing power than in your phone. Yes. (laughs) Which is also not flat for the record. (laughs) Which is also not flat. Yes. That's right. That's right. Um, So um, I didn't, I, uh, I didn't know a lot of, uh, uh, too many uh, other astronomy hobbyists when I was going through school. It's, uh, you know, it's, as, as you know, it's probably, it's not the most common hobby amongst people in school, but, uh, but I don't know if I don't, re- I was trying to figure out how I, how I ran into RASC and I just can't really remember exactly how it was, but I stumbled onto the RASC in the, uh, in the seventies and the, uh, in the, in the early, uh, early parts of mid seventies. And so then I met folks when I started going to the meetings in the old Queen Elizabeth II planetarium here in Edmonton, which was Canada's first public planetarium, we we would have the meetings were there, and I met folks like Alan Dyer, and Doug Hube, and uh, Franklin Lodi, pretty pretty famous names in RAC circles, and uh, and they were local members uh, at the time, and they showed me the full breadth of what you could do, you know, all the various facets of uh, visual observing. Uh, and even astrophotography at that time, because Alan Dyer was was uh, heavily into film-based astrophotography at the time. So, so that was really the what catapulted me into becoming avid. Uh, and then later, I took Dr. Hughes' uh, first-year astronomy course uh, in university, and that got me really hooked because we really got into the physics behind, you know, the introduction and also the physics behind it. And that was, and, and he was such a great lecturer that uh, it really got me hooked onto the hobby. Did, did you start using binoculars at all, or was it straight to a telescope when uh, when you first started using optical aid? Yeah, the, despite the uh, the the common uh, advice that we tell a lot of people to say, you know, start with binoculars because they're <laughs> easy and inexpensive, and you get wide fields and they're easy to use. I I went straight to telescope. <laughs> I just I didn't even I I, uh, I don't even know if I thought about binoculars at the time in junior high though. A buddy of mine, we, we, I think it was, I can't remember if we did it as an extracurricular thing or if we did it as part of a class project, but we built a four inch reflector, you know, with a cardboard tube and a, and a mirror from Edmund Scientific. And we built a mount out of wood and pipe, metal pipe. And, 
it was just a, a bear to move that thing. It was just jerky and wobbly. And there was no, I don't think we even put a finder on it. It was just psyched on the tube. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we built this thing and, but we had to look at Saturn with it. Yeah. Uh, and it was like, it was just amazing to be able to see Saturn through this thing that we built. And so that was the first telescope I ever actually uh, used was this thing. But my first real telescope, as was mentioned at the top of the show was, uh, the Orange 2 C8. I started subscribing to Sky and Telescope magazine, and they had for decades, they had the back page ad, the mm -hmm. full page on the back cover, which were always featuring the C14, the C8, and the C5 or 6, whatever it was, these orange tube things. And it's just like, and and so I had uh, that, I just, I, I saved up my money and I bought that. And that's back in the days where you, uh, you ordered it by letter and uh, and sent a <laughs> money order down to yeah. Celestron Pacific in Torrance, California. And then they shipped up the scope on Pacific Western Airlines. <laughs> oh, wow. That's <laughs> awesome. I had to go pick it up. I had to go pick it up at the airport and I didn't have a car. So neighbor had to drive me out <laughs> <laughs> to the airport to go get it. But back then you could write letters to people like Alan Hale, one of the co-founders. And if you needed some warranty service, you just write a letter and, they just would deal with it with a handwritten letter and they'd ship you the part or whatever you needed. No questions asked. It was quite a, it was quite a, a low, I mean, they, they, they were well known, but they, it was handled like a small shop in terms of customer service. It was pretty cool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what are you, what are you observing with now? What telescopes are you, or telescope or telescopes are you using uh, today? My main telescope right now is a Hubble Optics uh, UP12, which is an ultra portable 12 inch Dobsonian telescope. Nice. Uh, what's uh, the focal ratio? It's an F4, uh, uh, four, four something. It's very, it's very short. Uh, and, at, and so there's no ladder observing required. Mm -hmm. You don't, you're not even, a, even at the Zenith. So I like it for that reason. It's a down, I down, I, I, I changed to that a couple of, a uh, couple of years ago when I was using a much bigger 12 inch Dobsonian, which I found to be just more and more of a hassle to, to put into the car and drive out and things like that. So that, I like it's port, I like the Hubble's portability just because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's almost grab and go for a 12 inch. Yeah. yeah. So, I, so that's what I use. Uh, but it's a manual telescope. Uh, putting it on a, I'm putting it on a tracking platform, but there's no electronics on it or anything like that. The other telescope I have is it is a GenStar 10, which is a also an ultra portable Dobsonian of 10 inch diameter. Uh, and this was a teles this is a telescope that used to be made by a local Edmonton area telescope maker using uh, uh, for a while also using Barry Arnold mirrors, which are a famous mirror maker in these parts. Uh, but that scope is discontinued. So there aren't there, there aren't that many of them really uh, in, in circulation, but the Edmonton center of the RASC does have one, also has one of those in its loaner program. So it can be borrowed. And that one is is so small and so portable. You anybody can take it just about anywhere uh, huh. and, and be observing with a 10 inch. Huh. You know, I, I'm not familiar at all with the Gen Stars uh, until uh, you know, seeing the show notes for today's episode. And uh, just checking out some photos that you have on your website, uh, vanzella.com. And uh, this Gen Star looks like a super neat design. Like it, I can, you know, just see you with the material there. It looks ultra light and, and very portable. Um, very cool. It is. Yes, it is ultra light and very portable. Um, and and, that, and it, it's the, the rocker box uh, and mirror box design of it using the, the, the raceways rather than the standard. Dob Dobsonian type mount mm -hmm. um, makes it very very low profile. In fact, it, it can sit so low on the ground that you 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 have to bend you have to really bend over to you, you you're gonna, you're going to be doing sitting observing with this yeah. telescope. You're not standing. You're sitting and you're leaning <laughs> yeah. over. So in fact, I built a little wooden platform for it just to raise it up a little bit because yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so low. But uh, yeah. but that design kept everything very very uh, compact um, yeah. and, and tight. Yeah, very neat. Uh, is that rocker box uh, like metal or wood? It's all aluminum construction, um, except uh, for the, well, it depends on which generation uh, you have. The trusses are either aluminum or carbon fiber. 
So it uh, they went th- uh, the maker went through different designs on the trusses. But otherwise, it's all alu- uh, aircraft aluminum construction. About do you know about how many of these Gen Stars were were made? Just mm-hmm. in general, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. I would say certainly under a hundred. I don't. I don't actually. I don't know the. I don't have a count. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. No. Not a fair question. <laughs> would have been. Would have been in the dozens. I imagine. Shane's a bit of a collector, so he's now. I love putting in new telescopes that I. I'm pretty sure he hasn't heard of before, and then he's like, <laughs> "Wait, how come this telescope exists? And I don't know about it." <laughs> and you don't know about it. There you go. Well, you come out to Edmonton and you can try out the one in the lunar program, or you can come yeah. observing with me in the Den Star. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I'm intrigued. Like I used to be, uh, uh, like all of my telescopes in the past were Newtonians, and that's all I used. Now I'm I'm just using refractors and. Part of the reason is I, I like the ease of transportation and setup uh, of refractors and, and their lightweight, but, you know, these ultra light, unique designed Newtonians are really starting to appeal to me. And uh, yeah, maybe one day I'll get back into the reflector world with something like this. Yep. Yeah, there, um, there's, there's, there's quite a few choices, even, uh, even the classic dot maker obsession, although maybe things changed in the last few months or not, but the last time I talked to, Dave Kriege at um, Obsession, they had discontinued the classic daubs, the big, the big, massive wooden mounted ones, right? And they were yep. strictly making the the ultra UC, compact. the ultra compact series, because okay. he said nobody wanted to buy the wooden ones anymore. Okay. Although I see they're still advertising the classic, so I'm not quite sure what's going on. I haven't had a chance to ask him, but even he, at least as of last year, had switched only to the UCs, which are uh, much lighter uh, and all metal. Very interesting. I, I guess it makes sense. Why would you want to lug around something that weighs an awful lot when you could have the same performance uh, and have something that's far more transportable and easier to work with? So, I mean, it does it does make it does make collimation even more of a necessity on these telescopes because you're yeah. assembl- you're basically assemb- assembling them in the field all the time. But once you you know. Uh, once you get once you get the hang of it, it's collimation can be pretty quick, and I. And, and don't usually bother with uh, this uh, adjusting even the secondary. It's just mainly the primary mirror. So you're, it's pretty fast, but you have to do it. Mm-hmm. So you, you know you have to have a good tool, and you have to be, and you have to get good at it, so that you're not taking all night to <laughs> to get your scope ready. Yeah. Also, these things have lighter mirrors too. The the Gen Stars have the have pretty thick mirrors, unless they were you bought the versions with the Chinese mirrors. But the the Arnold, those were these two inch jobs, so pretty pretty thick mirrors. But the Hubble Optics one that I have. The 12 is a single uh, thin mirror. The the 14s and larger diameter are their uh, unique sandwich mirror design. So they're all very, very thin and light mirrors. So they they don't sell them with cooling fans because they, they don't take that long to cool up, cool down. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a big benefit for sure, especially yes. where we live, right? <laughs> yeah. The daytime to nighttime temperature swings can be quite large, even in the summertime. So it's nice to have a mirror that can keep up. That's right. Um, so maybe, uh, we're, maybe we should just jump into Black Nugget uh, Lake Observatory here a little bit. Um, you know, at the start of the podcast, it was mentioned that a new facility is, I think, being constructed to house a 32 inch telescope. Is that correct, Luca? That is indeed correct. We have uh, we are nearing the end of a very long project uh, to build a dark sky facility for the center. It will feature a 32 inch uh, telescope. The location is at the site of the annual uh, Northern Prairie Star Party, which happens every September, uh, which is about depending on where you live, anywhere from you know 45 minutes to an hour out, outside of uh, Edmonton. And that's so that's where we're, that's where we're building uh, this facility. Uh, so the 32 inch is uh, assuming it's a Dobsonian, and uh, what's the what's the focal length on that one? The mirror is a 32 inch uh, f4. Okay. Um, and it's going to be uh, it's the the design is is folded Newtonian mm-hmm. on an alt azimuth uh, fork mount. So it's not a Dobsonian. It's going to be on a fork mount, okay. but Altaz, but Altaz driven. And we had to fold the optical path uh, in order to get it to uh, fit inside the dome of this observatory, which uh, we ended up um, getting a, uh, the, the, the dome ended up being donated by the University of Alberta when they decommissioned their uh, site uh, out at Devon. 
a number of years ago. And so uh, in order to use that and the mirror with its current F ratio, we had to do a folded uh, design. And it's um, uh, and it's go to drive it's go to driven system and it's uh, it's a visual instrument at the moment and it's going to be used for RASC member observing and also for public outreach events. Suddenly, you'll have people moving to Edmonton just to join the Edmonton Center. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Could be. I, yeah. I'm and, also. Uh, I'm also envisioning like somebody who's never looked through a telescope before having their first experience with a 32 go. inch and then, and then thinking like every view will be like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah if, right. If you, if your first view of anything through an eyepiece is going to be through that telescope, you will be spoiled. Yeah, um, no kidding. It will be. Uh, yeah. It's maybe we should make it mandatory that you need to go look through something else first. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, outside, maybe outside on the lawn we'll have, uh, you know, like a six inch or uh, or something, right? And say, so, okay, yeah. look through that. Yeah, this is generally what happens, right? Uh, and then, but no, it's going to be, uh, yeah, it would be quite quite the experience. It's good. It should be. It should be very good for any um, experience level of of observer because even the 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 grizzled old veterans, the jaded astronomers, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, we can revisit even the old favorites mm. um, because if you've never seen them through such a large instrument, they'll take on a different appearance, right? There's possibilities of much more uh, 3D appearance on certain things, mm. um, like the Orion Nebula, for example. Even in a in something in the twenty in the twenty inch plus range, which I've had a chance to observe uh, through, um, it looks it ends up looking 3D even without a bino viewer. There's possibilities of some color on certain things mm -hmm. at that size of aperture. So even the old, you know, the old favorites, the stunners, uh, are, are going to look different to anybody that's even been observing for a very, very long time. The only catch on, on this instrument is the, you know, the field of view isn't that wide, isn't that large. So some of the really famous objects, uh, like M31, you know, which is, you know, you talk galaxies, that's what everybody wants to see. Mm -hmm. All the time is the Andromeda galaxy. Well, it's it's too big. Like it's just so massive. You know, its apparent angular diameter is so large, right? But is it five to six moon widths wide? The whole thing. Yeah, you won't be able to see. You won't be able to see the entire galaxy in 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 in, in an eyepiece uh, on this telescope. The field of view is just not big enough. Now you can you can do some touring uh, through the arms or through the core. And you'd probably have to put the core out of the field of view if you really want to get a detailed look at the arms because the core will be too bright mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and affect your uh, dark adaptation. Um, so, but uh, smaller objects uh, like M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, will fit nicely in the 21 millimeter ethos and just be bright. <laughs> yeah, that must be near photographic, I would imagine, with the aperture that, that large. I would say, I mean, even in an 18, I've seen it under pristine skies, uh, not in Alberta, but <laughs> under pristine skies somewhere else in Arizona, in Arizona to be specific. Um, and it looks photographic in an 18, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Especially when it's near the zenith. But on a 32, it should just be outstanding. Wow. Well, that's exciting. Good luck getting that built and operational and... Uh, I think you'll see me there shortly after that. <laughs> good, good stuff. Yeah. So first light is planned for a Northern Prairie Star Party uh, this September. Oh, that's awesome. People should go. I've been I've been thinking about driving up for it. To be honest, I think. Are you think? Are you, if you're thinking of camping, you should uh, make a decision on the camping spot Look soon. All right. Yeah, that's right. Good stuff. Details are on the Edmonton RSC website. Maybe we'll hop over to Carbon Stars if people are ready for that now. Yep. So, Luca, you've uh, you've come up with a, a carbon star list uh, called the Carbon Star Hunter list. Uh, maybe let's start by just uh, getting your background in this. How did you get uh, interested in carbon stars, and maybe what were uh, some of the first carbon stars you observed that really piqued your interest? Well, it all started uh, in August of two thousand and nine. We were out at the uh, Blackfoot uh, dark dark sky site that month and uh, a buddy of mine and I were trying to find the Crescent Nebula, which is in Cygnus. And at that time of the year, the summer triangle, especially Cygnus rides very high in the sky. So we're sweeping with our daubs 
Well, in fact, I had a, I didn't have my dog yet. I was still using my orange tube C8, but my buddy was, uh, had his 16 inch dog out there. And so we we're trying to find the Crescent Nebula and I'm trying to sweep the area around uh, Seder, which is the central star, Cygnus, Asterism. And as I'm trying to do a star hop to try to get to this crescent nebula, which is actually a tough nebula to look at visually, by the way, <laughs> I, I uh, swept by this, I suddenly stopped and I, this red star caught my eye in the field. And I looked at it and I go, oh, wow, that is, that is a very red star. It's really red. And it, it didn't look like a red giant star. It didn't look like a, a Betelgeuse or a, something like that, uh, that type of orangey red and scintillating and things like that. It was just this deep kind of dull red. It was just sitting there. It's almost like it was painted on the sky rather than it was shining in the sky. I don't know. It was just something about it. <laughs> you know, what is that? And so I, went, I was using this Arius, or the Sky Telescope pocket sky atlas at the time uh, for uh, star hops and things. And it showed a star labeled RS, and then in parentheses, lowercase c, beside the name, right where I was looking, right there where I was looking, it said, and I'm going, oh, oh, that, that there's a label. Oh, it, geez, I must have found what this is labeling. It's labeling a red star. That's what RS stands for. That's what I was thinking at the time. <laughs> How appropriate. <laughs> so I asked Jay, he said, hey, swing your big dog over there too and take a look at that thing. And so we, we had a look between my 8-inch and his 16-inch on this thing. And it looked less red. Curiously, it looked less red in his scope than it did in mine. But I uh, just, it was a very memorable thing. And then we eventually moved on to the Crescent, which was a big fail uh, that month for us. But that's another story. And so later I figured out, I, I, I looked up the star and I'm going, oh, oh, RS. Okay, yeah, it doesn't mean red star. No, that's not what that is. <laughs> I, didn't even, I, didn't, I didn't even know anything about variable stars at the time, really. And really, that's a variable star designation, RS. Uh, in in the uh, constellation Cygni, so R S Cygni, and the C was uh, this um, designation that they put in to say this is a carbon star. And so in the notes of the Pocket Sky Atlas, uh, it talks about that there were fifty five of these stars uh, plotted in the Sky Atlas in the in this Pocket Sky Atlas, and it might be fun for as a different kind of little observing project to try and. Uh, observe them all, but there was no list. It's not like it has a list. Like it, the Messiers are listed in the back of the PSA, uh, and then the page numbers for the charts. But the the red the carbon stars are all plotted, uh, and that's it. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. And so uh, it's, it's, if they all if they all look cool like that, I thought I want to observe them all. So I made a list uh, just to help. I uh, looked them all up and made a list. And I started observing those. And so that was really my introduction to the carbon star list was this stumbling across one and its designation and then reading about it uh, in the Atlas. In the end, I think you used a, a few different resources, you used the pocket sky atlas and then a couple other resources like uh, the Observer's Handbook and the Astronomical League. And just want to tell us about how many, how you sort of whittled down what stars you would have and yeah, a little bit more about how you, you came up with your Star Hunter list. Right. Yeah, not long after I, uh, I the project started off by just observing the 55. And that took a while because uh, it was, you know, they just do a few at a time, depending on the season and things like that. But the, the, the beauty about it is that those 55, just about any size telescope will work. They're not that, they're pretty bright. So if, you, if, you, if you're working with a small telescope, it's a, it's a pretty easy project to do. But um, sometime later, I stumbled across the uh, Astronomical League had published the, their carbon star observing list, uh, which had 100 stars in it. And then within, within the same year or so, the RASC published a list of carbon stars in the Observer's Handbook. And I wondered about, and I wondered, oh, okay, well, so now I can make a bigger project. I'll, I'll look at that. And I decided, well... I need to, uh, if I'm going to, I'm pretty sure there's duplication here. I wonder what kind of duplication there is. So I, I made a list of the unique entries across those three, the 55 in the PSA, the 123 in the Observer's Handbook, and the 100 stars in the Astronomical Lease Program. And so that made a list of uh, 140 something, uh, 42, or I can't remember the exact number of it, but it made a list of 
unique stars across all three. And the interesting thing was that that some entries were unique to each list. There was, you know, each one of them contributed to the overall list. I decided that I didn't really like the number of 142 or whatever it was. It, it wasn't 110 and it wasn't 100. And for some reason that didn't sit by, sit well. And so I decided to, uh, I got, I got to, I'm going to look up some more resources. So I started just searching carbon stars on the web and there's many resources, many lists, many articles and through a bunch of odds and ends and figuring out, you know, how, how would I get this to 150? I looked at a, at a brightness cutoff or a redness cutoff. And then, and then eventually I cobbled together this list of 150 stars that has all the unique entries across the three main sources, plus a few odds and ends of very red ones from other that somehow had not been included in those three lists. And that's what became the uh, Carbon Star Hunter list. Where can people find the list? It's on your website. Is that the only place or is there other places people can locate it? Uh, that's the only place that I know of so far. It's been referenced in a couple of articles uh, in some astronomy magazines, including one in the Netherlands, I think. But but if you go to vanzella.com, there's a link to my astronomy page there. And one of the articles is called The Carbon Star Hunter List. And that article gives the background about the list and what it's all about. And at the bottom of that article, you can get the list in either Excel format or Sky Safari uh, observing list. And if you use the if you use the Excel spreadsheet, you'll get a you can see all you, there's columns identifying where each you know which which source what the source is for each star, whether it came from the the three lists or it was some of the add-ons that I added. And then if you load Sky Safari, uh, then you just it can be an observing list that's on your uh, on your Sky Safari, and you can re, you can go through the whole thing with that. So what do the carbon stars look like exactly uh, to you, Luke? I know, like, depending on how bright or dim they are, they can take on a, a different appearance. So when you were doing the observations, would you just do one observation of each one? Would you try to catch it at a certain point in its luminosity? Or can you just tell us a little bit about, like, your observing of that list? Well, my, my main objective was to get through the list and so yeah. <laughs> that was really it. Yeah. And uh, I was mainly interested in uh, in the color, which I started to notice that they basically ranged in color from from no color, right, from basically no color to very red. And then I later learned that um, they're all variable stars. So, and the redness really seems, or the red appearance seems to, seems, is correlated with where it is in the light curve. They look redder when they're dimmer. So, and they're long period variables. So to really follow one of these through its light curve, you'd be spending either dozens or hundreds of days waiting for it to go through a full cycle. So I just didn't really have the energy to, to take that on. So I was mainly interested in how they appeared to me. One of my observing buddies uh, also took on the list uh, and he he liked to estimate their magnitude. So he also took it as a variable star observing uh, type program and estimated their magnitudes at the time. I was mainly looking at their redness and I and they ended up developing a personal color scale to come up with uh, so I could compare the redness uh, of each of them, right? The other thing is, uh, I also learned that, uh, well, I, I, the curiosity about them looking less red in bigger telescope. So I did a few side by sides again later, and it was true. They seem to look less red when on a side by side on a bigger scope than a smaller scope. Now, of course, if your scope is too small for how dim it is, that's a problem. You can't even see it, right? Uh, so there is that issue because some of them range by magnitudes, several, uh, they're ranged in brightness by several magnitudes. So they can be quite different. And then I also learned that there's a physiological effect of the, I guess, the eye brain system in which as light intensity decreases, red objects are perceived to be, to fade faster than blue objects of the same brightness. So they look, they look different. And so in terms of estimating magnitudes, the Purkinje effect uh, uh, has to be taken into account too, if you're using, uh, if, you're, if you're doing visual estimations of the magnitudes rather than photometry. So I, my, my main objective was to get through them all. Um, and I did it all using star hop techniques to find them. So everything was manual with the star hop. So 
in my notes, I I basically have I if there's interesting objects along the star hop, I made a note of that. Because sometimes you stumble across something else when you get into mm-hmm. it and you go, Oh, mm-hmm. didn't know that was there. Uh, and then when I look, then I and when I'm identifying the field to confirm it, uh, I, I look if there's any interesting asterisms in the field. Uh, I took a note of that because I'm I'm really big on on geometrical shapes in the field of view of anything I'm looking at. Uh, and then I would look at the color and I would do this uh, color scale that ranged from no color to uh, vi- what's the top and end of the scale. But they're extremely uh, no color through extremely extremely light red all the way through the very red or on the orange side, extremely light orange to very orange. So it's about a it's a uh, 10 points 10 point color scale uh, with the 11th point being no color is that on your web page i was just trying to find it here no that color scale isn't there i uh, i did a presentation of the pro- of the uh, project at the northern prairie star party in, uh, back in i think it was 2016 and uh, i talked i talked more in that presentation about uh, the look and this color scale but no i haven't updated the article yet about uh, about that part of it because that that's sort of I, I find that interesting. I, I was out last night. I think the one I was looking at was uh, HM Libre, which is a pretty red star there in the constellation of Libra. And I, I was thinking though, I was surprised how sort of orangey red it, it was, considering how low it was last night. And I was I was wondering though what phase I was catching it in. I was using just my little sixty millimeter telescope, and then I was thinking, well, if if it's brighter. That I think you know the brightness of it impacts that color. It would be nice to have that sort of scale for people to kind of reference and then to kind of plot when they observe it and what it looks like and what instrument they were using. And then you know they, they would sort of have a record of that. They could kind of go back and and reference. That's really cool. Almost like a, like a like a magnitude scale of of sorts, but for the for the color intensity of of these red stars. That that's super cool. There are some color palettes you can you can look up on the web, but I found they get, they assigned names to these colors. Yeah, like like, uh, 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 like rose or something like that. And I thought I did I didn't I, I decided no, I don't want to go that I want I want to talk about red and orange are the two main things. That's red right. and orange, reddishness, yeah, reddish reddishness is really the official the official part, and then orangeness. And then, of course, the ones that don't, I can't even perceive any color at all, I just go and see no color. And so, uh, yeah, I'll, I can revise the article uh, to include that scale for people that are interested in uh, in observing any aspects of the Carbon Star Hunter list. Did you uh, try sketching them at all? I know we have a we have a few observers who are sketching color. I, I've tried. I'm not successful yet at that. But ha- have you tried sketching them at all? No, I haven't. No, I'm not really, I'm not a sketcher. Okay. <laughs> I've done some sketching and it was hard enough. It's hard enough for me to do sketching just with charcoal. And so yeah. since I'm doing color objects, I'm going, ah, okay, I have to change pencils and things like that. And so, no, um, to me, it was just, I'll, I'll just record uh, what I saw. Sometimes I would look them up on the AAVSO because since they're variables, you can, you can get light curves for most, if not all of them. And you yeah. can look to see where is it in its light curve if you want. You're interested in seeing it. Did I, that, am I looking at it at its dimmest, somewhere in between, or at its brightest? You could you could take a look at that. But to try and coordinate the observations to the light curves would would make for a massive project because you could you know you'd have to make a, a calendar entry from two years from now to say okay you got to go look at that carbon star in 2025. Like <laughs> yeah. at this period. Yeah, if you want to, let's say you want to do, <laughs> let's say you want to do all minimums or something like that, right? Yeah, well, then, yeah exactly. First of all, uh, get your get your decade at a glance calendar out, and <laughs> and then also make plans to change the size of telescope you're going to use. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Because as Rick Husiak once, you know, I, I talked, I asked him about a few of them on the RASC list in the Observer's Handbook. Uh, and uh, after they made between after they first made that list, then they then they changed it, uh, revis- revised all the photometry and all of the various things yep. on it, and then they took out two stars, and added two stars, 
Yeah. You go, oh, thanks. Now you've just mucked up my list here. They go back. And, <laughs> so my, my observing count went from 148 out of 150 down to 146 because of Rick Husiak, right? But he but he was telling me about one, and, but one of them, he goes, yeah, good luck looking at that. It's it's at 18th mag. <laughs> and it's good. It's slowly coming out of a minimum and it's 18th mag. <laughs> oh, okay. So I made a note. So I, I personally still have two left to observe on the list. I have not actually finished all 150. Uh, I'm, I'm at 148. It's going to take me a while to do the last two. One of them is from the RASC list. Uh, and for some reason, it's declinate. It, 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 they chose a star with a declination of minus 60 or something, or of minus 50. Like you mm-hmm. cannot see it from here. And there's no way. And even if you, no. go, even if you go to Arizona or places like that, you can't. Uh, you can't see it. So that's going to take a while. And then the other one is one of the few that I added myself because of Brian Skiff's great article in Sky and Telescope in 1999. He had this great star, great article about carbon stars and why they're red. And he, and he gave a list of selected really, really red ones. And there was one that I made the cutoff for me for bright, uh, for redness. And so I added it and it turns out to be in Pav. I think it's in Pavo. And so that's also a bit far south too. So. Yeah. Yeah, so realistically, if, if you observe in Alberta, you won't be able to do all 150. Mm-hmm. If you observe from North America, then you can do 148. Maybe uh, we have a few minutes left, but maybe we should just touch really briefly on, uh, and you, you talked a little bit about carbon stars being C-type stars, um, which I think that that replaced the old J, N, and R designations. But uh, is there anything else we should just tell people about carbon stars, uh, why they should be interested in them? Well, sure. Well, briefly, um, carbon stars are most, almost all of them are variable late stage red giants, right? And uh, their periodicities range from about 70 to 400 days. Now, the, the, the big thing about red giants is that typically most red giants are richer in oxygen than carbon in their uh, atmospheres. But in carbon stars, that, that ratio is reversed. A lot more carbon. Um, being dredged up through these cycles. Um, well, there's two kinds, but in, in, in the main kind, this carbon gets dredged up from deep in the interior into the outer atmosphere. So those carbon molecules in the outer atmosphere, they act like a filter and they absorb a lot of the blue light and it results in the red appearance. And so the, this mental image you might have of a carbon star uh, having a, you know, a sooty appearance because of, uh, of carbon, right, is ac- pretty accurate, actually. Um, and they're cool, right? Their temperatures are uh, anywhere from three to 4,000 Kelvin compared to oh. our sun, which is 5,700 Kelvin, right? So carbon stars are cool. I like that. I like that yeah. carbon stars are just cool to look at. Right. They're cool to look at and they happen to be cool. They're also, they're also rare, uh, actually. There's only a mere handful that are easily visible to the naked eye. And there's only about 200 that appear among the half million stars that are brighter than magnitude nine. What would be, do you know what the, wow. what one of the brighter ones is? I'm just looking at your list here really quick to see if I can, what would be a good bright one that is naked eye? That is naked eye. Well, if I, uh, it's this, uh, I'll take a quick look here. I don't have them sorted. Uh, S scutum is 6'3", so that's pretty limiting. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. Uh, U Cygni is 5.9. Okay. Uh, and then TX Pichium. So TX in Pisces is 4.8 at its brightest. Oh, UU Origa. That, I think that was one of those. Oh. That, was, that goes 5.1. Right. So it said they can get into the into the you know into the upper end of the limit of uh, visual right. And of course, with binoculars, yeah. Uh, if you uh, if you could pick it out, depends how busy the star field is. You might be able to, to do it. But if you, I did a lot of them with a the three inch refractor. Right. I did a lot of them just yeah. with a three inch refractor. And so they're, so they're pretty rare. And just briefly, there's two main types. The classical ones, the carbon is a product of helium fusing into carbon, which the, which the giants need, reach near the end of the, uh, the end of their lives in the asymptotic giant branch. So they're, and they're, and these cycles, these, 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 these currents are, are dredging up this carbon from below into the top. So that's, that's the main type. Uh, of the classicals. There's also another kind that are called non-classical that are believed to be binary stars where one star 
is a giant and the other is a white dwarf. The giant star has accreted carbon material in its atmosphere when it was still a main sequence star. And it got it from the white dwarf when that dwarf was a classical carbon star. <laughs> so if a classical is, you've got carbon in its outer atmosphere, but it's part of a binary system, right? And then the other star transfers it to its own atmosphere. So those are the two main kinds. But it's all, it's all to do with this filter of soot and the outer atmosphere. Well, I think we're we're getting close to uh, close to time here. Uh, for people following along, uh, they can find Luca's carbon star list called the Carbon Star Hunter list at Vanzella V A N Z E L L A dot com. Yeah, Luca, do you have anything else to add to this episode on the carbon stars or anything else we talked about? Just one thing about the carbon star list. It's a good. It's a. It, it's a good. Uh, it's a good list to have in your uh, a sort of a in your back pocket uh, as something to look at when you're having you know when you maybe can't do deep sky or you're in the city and you don't have a dark sky or things like that or you have a small scope because you can kind of pick away at it uh, anytime you want with just about any observing aid you have. So it's it's always been good to have it uh, on the side uh, uh, <clears throat> as an as a back pocket observing list. And excuse me. And the other thing I'd like to say is I really appreciate uh, you inviting me onto this podcast to talk about carbon stars uh, because uh, it's really a, it is really a fun project, and I've really enjoyed talking with you today about it. Well, thanks a lot, Luca. I've learned a lot about carbon stars. Um, I haven't observed a lot, but the ones I have observed have been fascinating. And what really intrigues me to carbon stars as well as doubles is the ability to, ability to, to see color. And with some of those carbon stars, it's quite vibrant. And, you know, seeing color that striking through a telescope is not common. So it's, it's a really fun thing for me to observe. And we've had a lot of interest from a lot of listeners. So I think this episode is going to be appreciated by quite a few people. Thanks so much, Luca. We really appreciate it. No, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on. By the way, I did look up your article in the JRASC, which is the Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada on the solar analemma. And that was in the February 2015 edition. So if you just, if you actually Google JRASC, Luca, analemma, you will find a link to that PDF uh, pretty quick. Well, good. Thanks to everybody for listening. And thanks to Chris K for your suggestion for this episode on carbon stars. And actually we had several emails from listeners over the past little while about doing an episode on carbon stars. We had touched on it a few times. I'm personally very interested in making these observations. I made an observation last night, almost by chance. And like uh, Luca was saying, I'm, I'm going to print off. I have a copy of his list here right now, and I'm going to slowly start working through that on nights like last night, which ended up being okay for some deep sky, but not really. And then I just end up trying to look for interesting stars and happen upon one of the stars on this list. So looking forward to that. Listeners can always reach us at actualastronomy at gmail.com. Thank you everyone for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com.